Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Zoom Into Wine. It's time for the show and your host, Good evening, everybody. Ian Blackburn. So I want to welcome everybody to our Stars of French Wine. This is our first ever time gathering this, uh, this type of, a, of, a, of an event. Um, it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you here tonight. We're going to talk about some of my favorite wines and really cover a lot of, of ground. We've been producing Zooms now for the entire pandemic period. It was uh, something that came into our world, to, and I'm very thankful that it did. Uh, we pivoted from doing, producing live events in top hotels and restaurants all over Los Angeles, which are now very difficult to produce. But um, there is light at the end of the tunnel. I just hope it's not a train, and it keeps coming at us. But uh, I do hope that sometime we are able to gather again in person. But for the uh, foreseeable future, we will keep Wednesday nights uh, with Zooms. And we have a very nice uh, lineup of tastings already on our website through the month of March. And uh, we're going to continue to grow that arsenal of information and connectivity with great people, great wines. And uh, I really enjoy doing these. So thank you very much for joining us. I'm uh, hoping everybody got their wine kit okay. There's usually one challenge or two, but... Uh, you know, it is a couple of days before Christmas, and those delivery guys are really working hard. And we are challenged with that type of, uh, of a system as well. So if you got your kit and you are on this Zoom, we are accomplishing miracles right now. So uh, thank you guys for being here. We have some great experts joining us tonight, and uh, we, I want to be respectful to their time and get right into our event and start tasting some great wine. So... With that, if you wouldn't mind getting your rosé in the glass. I start with the rosé. You could argue this could come third in order. Um, you could place it in different, um, in a totally different order. Uh, since we're not really pairing it with food tonight, I believe the acid profile and the way this presents itself um, deserves it to go first so let's uh let's go ahead and and get into our powerpoint william are you there to join us i certainly am william davis is the head educator for wilson daniels and uh congratulations william you picked up a big brand today <laughs> um the news has got out so yeah we're quite excited we had, we had represented uh josh and the bergstrom wines in oregon for four years uh with our tri-state uh wholesaler uh in connecticut new jersey and, and new york uh but now we're representing josh's wines nationally so it, it is an exciting time uh we have represented ponzi as well as willa kenzie estate for a number of years and uh, that uh, contract, or at least our relationship with the Ponzi's, ended back in 2015. So uh, we couldn't think of a, uh, a better time and a better family to uh, jump back into Willamette. That's great. As you know, um, throughout the year, we host tastings on different topicality. Uh, this month, we're doing it on France. And if you have ever been to France, there's just so much to learn, so much to see, so much to appreciate. Um, it's really hard to encapsulate that in six wines in about an hour, but uh, we are here to answer any question, crazy questions that you've ever had, um, to really lay out the land for you, kind of show you on this map. You know, that's one, one of my, my favorite uh, educational things that uh, Kevin Zarelli taught me many years ago. I took a class with him at Windows of the World, and he said, you know, this is like a really unique place in the wine world because you don't see a lot of inter- know country competition they really make uh, very distinctive wines in very distinctive places um, like in California you know we can make Cabernet from north to south and Sauvignon Blanc at the same winery and Chardonnay at the same winery and Pinot and Zin and and but in, in France they're very site specific and they have a lot of rules and those rules continue to get a little bit more complicated um, because the wine industry is getting more interesting and there's a much higher uh, level of knowledge required to pursue wine at the highest level. So uh, we just kind of want to get um, some really amazing examples together. 
And William, thank you for talking to us about our first wine from Provence. And I uh, appreciate it. And cheers, everybody. I hope you guys enjoy the presentation. Well, thank you, Ian, for putting this on. And, uh, you know, uh, thanks for everybody joining us, uh, you know, on a, on a Wednesday evening so close to uh, Christmas. And hopefully you're enjoying that with family and friends. And it looks like everyone should have got their uh, wines. So as we go to the uh, the slide here, you should see um, uh, the map of Provence. Uh, so of course, where with the uh, inset map, you're looking at the southeast corner of France. You know, uh, Provence is going to run out into Belay and Côte de Provence that you see there on the right hand side of the screen, and then you'll actually follow that road that will continue uh, into the northwest part of. Italy, right? You know, Cinque Terre, uh, Liguria, and those areas. So we're right on the coast. Um, however, when you look at this map, the cool thing is, is there are different elevations. Of course, when you're right up to the, uh, on the coast, you know, sea level, but very, very quickly in a similar way that you'll see in California, uh, especially if you're right there in the central coast, you're thinking about the, uh, you know, like Big Sur, it gets up very quickly in elevation. So only about 10 or 15 miles inland, you're almost at 1,000 feet, sometimes 1,500 feet in elevation, uh, even 2,000 feet at some of the high points. So if you look right into the middle of that kind of dark purple area, that is where uh, uh, the, the, the Commanderie de Parasol is located. Uh, so you're in there it doesn't show it on this map but there's a massif for the massif de Morez uh that's located right there that provides some uh protection from any inclement weather that's on the north side of the provence you know because you're really not too too far from the um, uh in many ways like the what we call the uh uh, the the, the Hoa Alps, you know, so the Alp Maritime, which is located right there as it comes off of the map on the northeast side. So you do have some, you know, some inclement weather directly coming from the from the Alps, uh, as well as some inclement weather oh. that sometimes comes from the Mediterranean. So let's go to the next slide. And Parasol is one of the oldest uh, properties in Provence. Now they've been making wine there for uh, millennia. Um, you know, uh, even pre-Roman times. Uh, but this inset of uh, Parasol shows you that it's got this beautiful Mediterranean um, exposure and climate, but because of its elevation at about 1,200 feet, um, you get some really nice, cool nights as well. So let's go to the next slide. And what you'll see here are those great old vines of uh, Grenache and Syrah, um, and another very interesting grape variety that's uh, indigenous to the region called Tiburan. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, you'll actually uh, see the, um, uh, the wine here. The Le Clos is a very special uh, single vineyard, you know, and there's about a thousand hectare that the, uh, the estate of Parasol is located on. Like founded by the uh, Knights Templar uh, in the uh, 13th century. So well, it's only had three basically. owners in 800 years of history. Um, one, of course, was the French government after the uh, French Revolution in 1789. Uh, the second was the Rigor family. And then finally, in 2001, um, uh, it was passed to the current owner uh, that has a number of properties throughout uh, France as well as in Portugal. So this is the uh, one of the original houses uh, that the uh, the monks actually uh, stayed in in the uh, 17th and uh, early 18th century. So if we move to the uh, next slide. Before we leave this slide, oh. what are these? I'm sorry. So um, I should say that um, that is a, a very good question. Um, the <laughs> So, you know, you see you see the large barrels and then the uh, slightly smaller barrels. But I think that those are weights uh, that they'll use for either the um, the must, you know, the, the cap, the, the top of the cap, okay. you know, in order to bring that back down. Oh, huh. yeah, because, you know, that'll float up and it gets very hard and very, you know, uh, the concentration of the uh, of, of the of the uh, skins and the seeds and everything else when it flows to the top is to bring that back down for maceration. 
I believe that's what it's for, but I've I might entirely be that's wrong. Really fascinating looking. Yeah, I, I don't want to think of what else it might be. Um, <laughs> no, it is. Uh, that's what they would uh, train the wine, the uh, young winemakers with. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, you know, uh, with with this area, you know, it is based on clay and limestone, you know, because you are right there, uh, you know, not too far from the Mediterranean. So you will always have some limestone uh, present uh, in the south of France. Uh, but there are a high pr proportion of pebbles and we're going to get into some Chateauneuf a little bit later on. So, you know, we'll get a chance to talk about those later on. But I think a beautiful way to start off the evening. Thank you. Yes. Um... I became enamored with this product when I first read about it, the history, the age of the estate. And in fact, uh, I started really deep diving on Provence in this, in this last year to try to find some unique properties because we're trying to put a trip together for 2022. And I'm, I'm not sure what dates we're going we're gonna to try to push that out now, but uh, we're going to try to go now from Provence to Chateauneuf de Pop and uh, cover some ground there. It's an area I have not actually traveled to Provence ever. And there's some beautiful hotels and resort properties. And uh, we'll probably use Lyon as our base and do make it kind of a culinary uh, experience as well. Nothing wrong with that. And actually Parasol does have a hotel. You know, they have, uh, I think it's 15 or 20 rooms as well as a restaurant and then an incredible art gallery. Um, and a lot of that you'll find out in the vineyards as well. Well, we'll have to talk about that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, William. I'd love to turn it over to the, the folks in the room and uh, get some impressions. Uh, how do you how do you like the rosé? Josh and Jen, it's great to see you again. Thank you, guys. Well, if I had a comment on the rosé and yeah, um, by, by the way, my brother is here tonight from Sacramento. His wine arrived at six fifteen. So mm. we're, we're we're blessed. This is beautiful, crisp minerality. The crispness of this wine, it's cut with just a, a sharp knife. It's it's so beautifully crisp, um, and the minerality so strong on it. I, I that that's not normally a price point I pay for my rosés, but I can see why now. Yeah, it is definitely on the uh, higher tar tariff of, of rosés, and that's kind of what intrigued me about it. I'm like, what what's going on here? So I really wanted to get a little closer to this wine, and uh, I think it's gorgeous. I think the packaging is spectacular too, William, and uh, they really do put it in a beautiful bottle, and it's it's really a, a kind of a ultimate rosé for the category. That I would agree. I mean, there are the, this is as well as another wine that they make a, a tiny amount uh, of called the 1204, uh, reflective of the uh, uh, the year that the uh, uh, the commandery was founded. Uh, so uh, yeah, these wines are very expensive, but they're also very exclusive. And you can see that these are rosés that are built to age as well. They're beautiful when they're young, uh, but there's a lot of rosé out in the market that. You know, is is it's designed to it's designed to be consumed as quickly as possible. You know, this is a wine that would uh, deserve a seat at the table of you know uh, of, of of any great table, uh, and with any world class wine. And you know, rosé is not just for summertime anymore. It is uh, absolutely fantastic year round, especially here in California with our climate, our our amazing produce, and the type of restaurants that we. I mean, this and Mediterranean food is just really a perfect pairing. And we have so many great Mediterranean restaurants in Southern California. So that's going to be my, that's going to be my recommendation. Maybe some great sushi. Um, I like playing with this wine with all types of things. There's really no limit. Well, this with ham, if anybody does ham for Christmas, this is, you know, an incredible pairing. Beautiful. Thank you for that. All right. Well, we're off to a good start. That's my first wine of the day. I sent out about 300 packages today. My hands, man, I cannot wait to get some sort of a pedicure or something like that. My my hands, I, I I'm not a box guy normally, so I, I'm built like uh, you know very soft skin, and uh, 300 boxes have tortured my uh, my hands. So um, 
Uh, I can't wait to spoil myself with a little bit of time on Friday. I'm gonna get a little spa time and get my my fingers back in my in good shape. My wife says I'm more high maintenance than a woman, but uh, that's okay. All right, let's go to our Sauvignon Blanc, and we've got Noreen Lyon uh, joining us from Mark Key Mark and Domain. Maison Mark and Domain. Maison Mark and Domain. Sorry. It's okay. M M D. M M D. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hi everybody. Thanks for tuning in. So I am representing the Loire Valley, and if you want to throw that. Okay, so that's the wine, Comte La Fond. We're gonna be trying the, the one of the most classic Sancerre's, the 2019. And if you wanna throw the map up. Sure. Okay, so the, Lo yeah, this is, so the Loire Valley is the northernmost wine region of France, and it's on the longest river in France, the Loire River. And Sancerre is all the way on the right side, um, across the river from Puy Fume. And so all one thing about the Loire is out of all of France, it is the most diverse region as far as you can get bubbly, you can get you can get still, you could get dry, you can get sweet, very sweet, you can get anything in between. You can get rose, red, white. Um, one thing that all the wines in the whole region have is they all have great acidity the just like champagne they the wines in this region um they fringe on the lowest temperature that you could actually ripen grapes and this gives this gives all the wines from this region what they call in france a nervosité which is like a nerviness mm -hmm. and um so we're gonna try a sancerre today that's actually made from the one of the best if not the best uh Puy Fume producers so it's by La Doucette uh, you can roll to the next slide wow okay so that's the castle and if you go to the next one I think it's even a better shot of it yeah there you go so Comte Fond in set well this has been in the in the Complefond and Lajuset families since 1787. And the Complefond, their historical painting, um, he purchased this castle from the illegitimate daughter of the French King Louis the <laughs> Fifteenth. And and the estate is still in the, the same family as is every winery in my whole portfolio. Um, uh, can I ask but, you uh, which illegitimate daughter? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's that's a good story. I don't know, Marie. I don't know. Um, and so Baron Patrick de Lajuset is now the descendant who who runs it, and he's had it since nine since um, 1972. And he also decided that instead of making this landmark Puy Fume, that that they would still make that, but they would also make Sancerre and also actually Vouvray, Chinon, Muscadet, but we are tasting the Sancerre, so we'll talk about that. Um, their wines are considered top of the class. This Sancerre, if you read the wine Bible, this is the one that has a picture that they say you should know. Um, that um, That's a nice picture. I haven't seen that one yet. Mm. <laughs> the philosophy of the house is is it's all about the terroir it's all about the grapes they ha they vinify every plot separately so that they can get the, the the you know the qualitative differences of each plot by itself and then blend it together there's no oak use no no oak barrels for fermentation for any of the white wines they use glass lined concrete tanks so that it's all about the freshness and the terroir they have three different soil types they have limestone which um, produces a very perfumed and delicate style of wine 
They have flint, which adds depth and minerality. And then they have clay, which is on the highest part of the slopes. And that gives more of a firm, rustic character. So they use all three of those and create the, the, the blend that they want to. It is 100% Sauvignon Blanc, so it's not a blend of, of um, grape varietals. But um, those are the three different you know, mini terroirs they've got. Um, and each vine is around 30 years old. And this talks about how everything is gravity fed. And just so they, they you know, nothing gets damaged and the, the grapes are as fresh and pure and runoff juice and all that as you can get. Mm -hmm. um, and inside of this brand's portfolio, this is the top cuvee, right? This they they have a they have a reserve as well, Combo okay. Fond. So they they have a, a reserve white that is just aged longer in bottle before it's released, and they were actually the first to make a reserve white in the Loire, and that would be their Puy Fumé that's called Baron de L. So this this uh, I've always loved this wine. This is a classic. This is like benchmark. Sancerre from a top producer of merit and I wanted to include you know that type of an example throughout our entire tasting today um, this one comes into stock and leaves stock pretty quickly it's not abundantly available in fact I'm about to run out Noreen so uh, let me know if anything changes but um, we we have a few bottles it is a wine that can age really nicely for a few years um, I love it with like one, two, three years of bottle age on. I think it gets even more interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a type of wine that you would find presented at a Michelin star restaurant as an example of the category. Um, and uh, Sauvignon Blanc sales have been tremendous and Sancerre sales have been amazing. But... The bad news is that in 2021, they had massive frost issues in Sancerre. And there is about to be a complete uh, evacuation of the wine departments on the Sancerre category um, because there just isn't any supply. And we are already moving into, you know, uh, the vintage. This is a 2019, so the 2020 will be here very soon. And when it's gone, there will be a whole year without without inventory. And this kind of issue is pretty topical kind of on the moment because this is happening around the world. We lost a vintage in Napa Valley with 2020. We've lost, uh, we had some uh, tough crops in Bordeaux and, and uh, throughout Burgundy. Burgundy's been all over the place. Great vintages, but small vintages too. And world demand has been uh, stripping the wine supply pretty fast, and it's it's been it's been real. I mean, Noreen probably knows it more than anyone. She represents Rotor Champagne and a lot of other products. And they're, I mean, you are sales manager. Do you even have wine to sell, Noreen? No, we're out of champagne. <laughs> yeah. And that's uh, I, I think I can ask pretty much everybody. They're all watching their gauge, and uh, you know I was just grabbing. Uh, amazing number of, of products to be able to have. I have over 50 champagne in our store now, but I don't have a lot of any of them. Um, and I'm just hoping to make it through like Valentine's Day. I think uh, by Valentine's Day, the world's really going to know that this is serious. But uh, this is a beautiful Sancerre and uh, beautiful property. So, so yeah, those bottles in this picture on the left are the Puy, Puy Fumés, I believe. And then the kind of round bottles, that's this wine, but the reserve version of it. Oh, I see. Wow. Yeah. And I've then, and I don't know, I threw the slide in there. I thought it was nice. And also it, it brings up the conversation that even though this is Sancerre, that right over the river is that castle and this is the winery there. And so it's, it's, even though it's Sancerre, it's, it's, vinified here and it's very close beautiful there's the, there's the baron he looks like an affable guy 
<laughs> so if you've ever had the La Doucette, the Marc Bredief, the La Poussie, the Renyard, or the Baron Patrick labels, that's all by La Doucette. Terrence, did you have a question, sir? I'm gonna unmute you there, buddy, I'm sorry. Can't hear you yet, Terrence, hit that button. There you go. That last slide looked like a tasting room. Is that a, was that a, is that a tasting room in sense there at the, at the winery? Yeah, yeah, that's at the, that's a part of the castle that we're looking at. That's fantastic. I have not been there yet, but maybe this year. The so, um, Noreen, oh yeah, you got a question? Go right ahead. Sorry, Ian. Um, so Noreen, my question is actually, this is bringing me joy because I was supposed to be um, in the Loire right now. Unfortunately, my trip got canceled. Oh. Um, so is this tasting room one that is by appointment only, I'm guessing? Um, because my trip is delayed, I, this would be a lovely spot to visit, and especially because this is such a lovely expression of, of Sensair. Um, take my take my email um, and let me know your plans, and I'll see what I can do. I don't know how how quickly they get booked up, how far okay. out it is, but um, doesn't hurt to ask. Not at all. And and secondly, um, it's interesting because this says that this is on the leaves, which is the dead yeast with some agitation. And the thing I'm enjoying about this is I'm not getting um, that overpowering brioche or, or bready yeasty type, um, you know, taste. So this is this is really delicious. I'm, I'm really enjoying yeah. this. I think the, like the glass lined tanks or glass lined, um, yeah, concrete tanks really help with that. So yeah. this is all about the fruit, no oak, and then it's they definitely do not use mallow or anything like that. That would give it, you know, richer, richer vibes. Yes, and yeah, dairy, a bit of a dairy taste to it. So thank you. And and also Ian, thanks for hosting. First time taster, longtime fan, graduate of your law program. So glad awesome. to be here. Wow, that's so <laughs> great. I'm so happy yeah. to see you. Thank you. Yeah, likewise, sure. Actually, I don't see you. Can you wave? Yeah, I'm, I will. <laughs> yeah. See if I can figure out how to do that. Yep, oh, I did. There we go. Hey. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, likewise. Well, Noreen, thank you. Um, we love uh, the Sancerre. Well, like I said, we we the amount that we got, which is pretty significant, has uh, been moving through the the flow pretty well and we don't have a whole lot of supply at this point but we still have some so if you like that um, uh, you know, all of you have been armed with a special discount code uh, tonight you can save 10% off not only the wines that we're featuring on this tasting but any wine on the website tonight that uh, allows for discounting um, uh, so you can use your 10% discount as a participant in this event and whether you buy one bottle or 10 or more well, when you get to 12 bottles on our website there is automatically a 10% discount and a lot of people don't know that but uh, we encourage that it's uh, part of our business model um, if we're going to be shipping the wine for you and we do it very low cost it's uh, free delivery in Los Angeles on orders over $100 and it's $10 delivery in California which we subsidize pretty hard uh, so we encourage larger orders that way and uh, we're giving our best shots to try to find uh, what works. So um, uh, take advantage of that tonight if you can and uh, support any of these great wine brands. Without any further ado, let's move into our Burgundy. And uh, I know Noreen's, um, how old is your baby now, Noreen? He's 20 months. 20 months, so he'll be calling soon. <laughs> so if you're not there, we appreciate your time tonight. Thank you very much, Noreen. Thank you all. So uh, we now head down to Burgundy and I have taken groups to Burgundy on many occasions over the past 20 years. I used to work for Louis Jadot and um, I love Burgundy. In fact, there's a part of me that hopes I can retire in bone. That's my life plan. And so um, I'm always very interested in what's happening in Burgundy. Uh, the Burgundy wine market has gone absolutely nuclear. And when you list the brands that matter the most in Burgundy, this is one at the top. Now, with that being said, uh, we kept it real. And uh, this is one of their entry wines. 
Uh, it's a Mac Mancom Verze, and William, you import this as well. You import this and Domain Roman Conti from Burgundy. Your portfolio is like Noreen's, really, you know, packed with some of the heavyweights. Um, but uh, Laflave is absolutely one of the most important producers in Puini, and they are reaching out and doing some other things because when you own vineyard in Puini, you're limited because there is no more vineyard to buy, no more grapes to grow. And if you have a tough vintage, a short vintage, you know, you need to have some other projects. So they've really invested some money in the Mancon and I'm quite uh, enamored with the new project up in uh, the Loire Valley too. The Violette wine is on our website, William. Mm, well, thank you for that. Yeah, it's 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 funny because when you, in, in order to understand Domain Lafleve, um, you have to understand the 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 history. They just celebrated their three hundred and fourth uh, year in existence because uh, the, uh, the the family moved to uh, Pouligny in seventeen seventeen. Uh, so now we've got what uh, thirteen generations uh, that have been uh, responsible for making the wines, and they are the what I call the largest producer uh, of estate wine in Pouligny. So they're the largest owner of Premier and Grand Cru land. Uh, and in much the same way uh, as Domaine de la Romanée Conti, some of you might refer to it as DRC, uh, in Von Romanée and Flagé Echezo up in the uh, Cote de Nuit, a little further north. So if we go to the next slide, I'll actually be able to show you, uh, uh, you know, that, that map itself. Uh, so in order to understand Burgundy, it really is all focused on one part of the Massif Central, which is that large uh, kind of area right in the middle of France. If you look at the inset map of France, there's a large er area there, the Massif Central, that's a huge plateau, if you would, um, with some of the oldest soil uh, that, that's in existence, you know, uh, much of this being three, four hundred million years, if not older in age. Uh, but as that starts to drop off on that eastern side, there's uh, not only a valley system, but then it pops right back up to the, the Alps that you'll find there on the far eastern side of France as it goes into Switzerland and, of course, uh, Italy. But here, this is a gently rolling or uh, undulating slope that comes off of uh, about a 2,000 feet to 2,500 feet in elevation part of the Massif as it runs to the center of France. And as you come off of that, these beautiful, you know, these hillsides, they kind of drape off. Uh, it's the best way for me to describe it is if you are, if you've ever been in Napa Valley, you see some of the hillside vineyards on both the east and the west side of the valley, uh, as they might roll up to the Vacas Range or the Mayacamas Range. Um, that's kind of what it looks like, um, but not as steep uh, as you might see, like you know, Howell Mountain or uh, Mount Veeder. Uh, but here. You know, with uh, with with the Cote de Bone and the Cote de Nuit or the Cote d'Or, that's where a lot of the very expensive wines historically have been. But as you come further south uh, into um, Cluny Macon, uh, Villefranche sur Saint, uh, or the Saône River, uh, uh, as it runs down into Lyon, and then actually you're right there in in, in Beaujolais land, um, they make exceptional uh, Chardonnay. Um, most people are familiar with Puy Fousse, um, or, uh, you know, affordable Chardonnay from the Macon Village appellation, which can be anywhere 40 or 41 villages. But in Macon Verze, which is just on the north side of the, the very important area of Puy Fousse, is where you'll find these vineyards. So if we go to the next slide, this is the, uh, the doorway to uh, the estate itself in Pouligny. So uh, it's labeled number one. This is where uh, the main road or the Grand Rue comes off of the main road in Burgundy in Pouligny. Um, and it joins just on the eastern side uh, of the town square. And that's where the, uh, the, the domain and the family um, have been for 300 years. So let's move to the next slide. 
and you will see how important uh, historically and how much uh, they are a part of the fabric of the village of Pouligny. Of course, Montmarché is the most famous vineyard, arguably for Chardonnay, in the world. Um, so you'll see uh, on the left-hand side, that is a gate. Uh, so this is how uh, producers or, or winemaking families and farmers uh, would mark their plots because you have a multitude of, of families or uh, individuals that that own the land in many of these premier and grand cru. So this is the Montmarché from Domaine Le Fleuve. And the irony for the most expensive wine that Domaine Le Fleuve makes is that their vineyards are not located in Pouligny. They're located on the Chassagne side. Because if you um, think about where that map is, you think about, well, there's Pouligny Montmarché, and then there's another village called Chassagne Montmarché, well, that's because the two villages of Pouligny and Chassagne added the name Montmarché, uh, which is named for the hilltop that's directly behind and to the west uh, of the vineyard of Montmarché. Um, so that's why, you know, sometimes you'll hear people talk about Pouligny or Chassagne or, um, you know, as being, you know, owners of this incredible plot of land. Uh, they only make one barrel of that Montmarché, you know, from the uh, gate that you saw. And usually those will go for about uh, three to four thousand dollars a bottle, if not higher, depending on the vintage. And if you could ever find a bottle, because again, there is one barrel that's made every year. So it's about, um, about a thousand bottles, give or take. So let's move to the uh, next slide and we should see. Um, Again, the, uh, the, the, the tech sheet for Macon Verze. Now, in order to understand why did the Lefleve family move here, it's because Anne-Claude Lefleve, you'll see in a future slide, she took over the winery when she was 26 years old and she converted the vineyards in Pouligny uh, over to biodynamic farming in the early to mid 1990s. She saw the success there and then she decided to start purchasing land because there was nothing to purchase in the Cote d'Or, the Cote de Nuit, um, or in the Cote de Bonne, sorry, uh, into Macon. So they farm exactly the same way as they do with those wines that are uh, certainly a, a, a part of uh, the history of Domaine Le Fleuve, but with uh, more of a, 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 a rounder texture. Um, the wines are a little easier to drink when they're young, uh, but they can age for 15 or 20 years without a problem because they do believe in the utmost quality. So to think that this is a wine that, yes, it's expensive for compared to any other Macon Verze, but you always look at the producer uh, dictating uh, the level of quality in a region like Burgundy. So let's go to the next slide. Sorry if it's flipping out, it's very sensitive. Sorry about that. Sure. So you can see here, this is uh, one of the, uh, this is actually uh, one of the plots um, in, uh, in Pouligny. So this uh, is the top part of uh, Chevalier as it runs back out toward the uh, village of Pouligny. You see it's a very sleepy, small village. It's not, not very large at all. Um, if we go to the next slide, you'll actually, you should actually see Anne-Claude here. Um, she was an incredible woman. Unfortunately, she passed in 2015. Um, at the age of 59, she uh, she had cancer. And due to her belief in in uh, biodynamic farming and really the principles, it's, uh, it's a way of life for her. Um, she opted not to go through chemotherapy, but the winery is in excellent hands. They've continued um, her vision for biodynamic farming. Uh, and in everything that they do. So they just completed a um, a new cellar and a new aging room um, that is in the shape of an egg. Because in this area, you can't dig too deep uh, underground because there's a fairly high water table uh, in the village of Pouligny. Mm -hmm. So you can see her there. She was uh, uh, an absolutely wonderful woman. Really go a, pioneer, to the next a pioneer in the... Uh... Uh, and biodynamics in, in Burgundy. 
Absolutely. Um, we're fairly fortunate with our portfolio because we also represent the wines of Coulet de Saron, which we're not tasting here. So she worked with Nicolas Jolie, who was considered to be that uh, godfather of biodynamic uh, farming, at least for winemaking uh, in France. And he started back in the uh, mid to late 70s. So this is a much larger uh, part here. You can actually see uh, the um, uh, the vineyards here, you know, kind of in this undulating kind of valley. And as I mentioned earlier, that's what it tends to look like. You've got, you know, just kind of like this even slope uh, with the uh, vines and the vineyards coming uh, off of that. And so with the uh, final slide, uh, you'll see, yes, it snows in uh, Burgundy pretty much every year. It's a continental climate. So things get, they do tend to get warm during the uh, summer, um, but then they get very cold in the winter because you're not close to any uh, uh, moderating influence in terms of uh, you know, a body of water or uh, a coastline or an ocean. It's meticulous uh, the way they take care of this vineyard. And I was there, William, on a day when they were, they brought their, that, that was the horse called uh, the Persian, uh, boy, I can't remember that, it starts with a P. But this big, beautiful horse pulling a uh, sleigh and tilling yes. the oil, and it's just so powerful, and no machines in the vineyards, <laughs> and just really, really um, meticulous. It, it really is. So uh, thank you for, uh, you know, for, for actually, you know, experiencing this wine. You know, the 18s were uh, stunning. They were warm, so a little easier to understand. They don't have as much tension as other vintages in Burgundy, uh, but a really good introduction into what Domaine Lefleve and world-class Chardonnay from Burgundy is about. Yeah, this is around $60 on the website. Um, and inside of the Lefleve portfolio, that's about one eighth of the cost of anything else that they have. I do have a, um, a Premier Cru uh, from Laflave on the website as well. Uh, and uh, th those are the areas that take some time to stock a good wine store. We have to build it slowly as we, the capital can kind of come back to us. And, and that's what we are in the process of doing. Um, but we, to be a good wine store, you have to have great wine. And I'm working really hard to do that. And I'm not trying to get too too uh, expensive, but I want to have a nice diverse set and really, you know, uh, leaders in the category. And Laflave is is certainly who um, a lot of people are looking for to kind of give you credence in the in the white burgundy category. So William, thank, thank you, you very much. Um, I really enjoy this wine. I think it's a it's kind of a, a statement wine, even though it's casual and can go with just. You know anything that you're going to uh, eat on a regular daily basis whether it's fish or chicken um, and or turkey um, this is just really a, a an enjoyable wine that you can share and let people know that this is one of the best producers in the category well this with uh, white truffles since truffles are in season mm. it's a uh, it's a life changer that's that sounds good to me any questions for William about this wine, Terrence? I see your hand up there. I'm sorry, I think that went up a while ago. I, yeah, go appreciation. Ahead. That was just an appreciation of what you're trying to do, Ian. <laughs> it's been your wine shop. Very nice. Thank you, man. Thank you. And I have to say, Ian, I'm so impressed that each little bottle I'm opening here has just the most amazing. It's retained everything. There's nothing lost by by. However, you're packaging this magic in these little bottles, um, they still taste as amazing as if I was just pouring it with a bottle. So this is you really know, great. Honest to God, I, I, I'm so happy we found a container that we can keep in stock that is easy to clean and sanitize. And it's done just that I, I, for every single wine. Uh, we, For those of you that live outside of LA, we poured these on Monday afternoon. Um, and quite honestly, they might even be better than, uh, in some ways, than the wines we poured uh, last night for the people we made local deliveries for today. Um, could could vary too between the lineup, but um, two days in that decanter is just like a, a wonderful slow decantation, 
and uh, it's worked out really well. So I'm glad you think so. And yeah. uh, it's really important that uh, you know wine people see that this is there's no degradation in the quality. It's really important to us. No, it's doing these wines all the justice that they deserve. Especially the, the Chardonnay is amazing. Thank you, William. Excellent. Thank you. Fantastic, William. Thank you so much for being with us, and uh, thanks to the Wilson Daniels um, company for having you. You're you're just such a, a wonderful wealth of information, and I love your style. So thank you so much. Thank you. We now move into our first red of the night. And my buddy, John Baccio, is on the Zoom. Hi, John. How are you? I'm going Terrific. To Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I do. I do appreciate it. Um, and I get to talk about one of my favorite wineries that we work with, uh, uh, Domaine du Banneré. Uh, so from Chateauneuf du Pape, I, I have a bottle here uh, and uh, you'll see it obviously on the slide. Um, <clears throat> the, the best thing about this wine is that this is uh, this is uh, oh this is great thanks for thanks for that Ian too the the uh, we just got this picture today which is really funny but uh, anyway so we're 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 back down in the south of France now so Chateauneuf du Pape is the region it's quite famous. Uh, <clears throat> If you know uh, uh, Avignon, maybe maybe you uh, there's a, a, a French uh, a song that little French and British children uh, learn to sing, Sur le Pont d'Avignon. Uh, uh, it's a it's it, it's it's a it's a um, it's a wonderful historic region. Um, so a lot of people ask me, and maybe maybe you already know this, but just just a lot of people ask me about why the, there's the embossed uh, 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 bottle on a bottle of uh, uh, Chateauneuf du Pop, and I'll, I'll quickly mention that, and then we'll move on. Um, but uh, it's always got a, a, a Pope's uh, mitre and two keys uh, because that symbolizes the um, the the new house of the Pope. Uh, that was uh, you know uh, back in the 14th century. There was a there was a. Uh, lots of drama happening in the catholic church and uh and they built a, a a new spot for the pope in the south of france uh and there was a you know possible split and all this very interesting stuff that we don't have time to go into but uh uh it's very very fascinating but so even though this this region is quite old uh and uh grapes have been grown there for a very very long time uh the uh the this this chateau of du pop uh, was was really um, you know the f first bought about brought brought about and uh, uh, planted well uh, uh, the Gascon Pope uh, Clement V uh, takes credit for it but it was really his successor uh, who planted the, the the vineyard right around the the, the new house of the Pope. Um, but uh, the the region sort of came into the modern age after phylloxera, which was a a little bug that that killed all the vines, most of the vines throughout the world. And, and after that was replanted in the 1920s, um, the, the, the region itself uh, was the first one to sort of codify, um, or at least they, they like to claim that they were the first to sort of codify some of the rules about how to uh, uh, grow grapes and when they can harvest and the permitted varieties. This is a wonderful winery because it's one of the few that remains in in the region, one of only uh, a couple actually that uh, makes wines from all the permitted varieties, and there are many, many permitted varieties. Uh, so even though on the uh, this is a tiny, tiny little winery, uh, it was actually the little crest that you see there was the crest that uh, that the 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 family created in the 1400s. They've had it for a long time. Actually, they have some history in the United States as well uh, in the in the 1700s um, one of the uh, the uh, ancestors of the family actually was a, 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 a he was a like a general I think in the in the the, the French army and he was involved in um, in running one of the uh, the the villages in uh, Louisiana in the United States uh, so uh, very very interesting long long history but um the the picture that uh, that 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 Ian had um Ian can you quickly pull up that one little picture um that I sent no. you today yeah yeah can you find it again really quick sure. it's no. I know it's tricky to do um mid mid uh presentation uh again I'm sorry we just got this 
picture today, but it's it's a good one. So what what's great about this this region are these 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 they're quite famous actually these stones that you see under these these uh vines this is a picture that the winery sent us most of the vines in this at this winery are uh you know 70 or so years old uh and um and those 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 stones the galet or uh, pudding stones the the english call them they're they're really important because in this region it's very very far south this is a region where they're very worried about uh, uh climate change um because the 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 heat is 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 you know really can be punishing down in this in this area but they get a lot of a lot of a lot of winds here here, the Mistral winds um, uh, uh, come off the water, but these stones are great because they actually um, they actually can help retain uh, some some warmth and radiate that back up into the vines. So when they when they have some cooler periods, uh, sometimes they have uh, some 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 chilly winds, but the 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 uh, fruit can um, and the and the vines can retain some warmth because they can radiate heat from the sun. So it's a it's a fascinating region you can see also how how low the the vines are are, are trained here um anyway um this is to uh these stones weren't moved here these stones this is what they found right at the near the rhone river and these stones are rounded because they they've moved some miles and they you know the river is powerful and wide and really created this feature and I love it. They call it the the blood of stones, the wines of this region. So it's really a, an important part of the Chateau of the Pop story. Yeah, I'm so glad. Thank you for for that, Ian. I'm so glad that uh, that Audrey sent that picture earlier today. Um, so anyway, um, this is cool because it's very different than the sort of modern uh, Chateau Neuf that we that we see. Um, Chateau Neuf in the last. I don't know, um, you know, Ian, you you would know better than me, but maybe maybe ten or fifteen years or so, because of the heat that they uh, get down in in Chateau Neuf du Pop, um, a lot of producers have sort of been chasing this 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 ripeness that the uh, that uh, I don't know uh, Americans uh, that we we, we like um, a little bit of wine press. Chasing yeah, forward. yeah, um, and this winery has never done that. This winery has always made wines uh, that are very, very traditional. So in this, in this, this, uh, this region of France, so the the Grenache is the is the is the the the, the leading grape. Um, but uh, as I said, this winery is one of the 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 rare wineries that uh, that that does these these amazing sort of uh, co-fermenting with white and red uh, varieties. Um, they use wild yeasts and 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 uh, everything is done uh, much in the same way that it's always been done there. And in fact, it's funny because on the 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 back of the bottle, so it's also a tiny winery. So in a big year, they get about a thousand cases their production. Uh, most average years, they only produce about 400 cases. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the back labels are always very funny because they only tell part of the story. In this particular one, uh, this particular vintage, it was 60% Grenache, 10% Syrah, uh, uh, and 10% Mouvedre. But my favorite thing is that that there's 17 percent other black varieties and three percent other white varieties that's and they don't, they don't even bother putting that on the back label because there's no way that they could list everything um and uh uh, uh just so they, they they their sort of math doesn't really um uh add up to to, John, to meet the regulations sorry John, there's a good uh, trivia question in there you know you can always ask your wine friends you know how many different grape varieties can go into a Chateau Neuf de Pop. Right, many. <laughs> yeah. Is the answer 13, John? It is, the answer is 13. Yeah, the answer is 13. And actually this the, the, this property has, um, uh, has uh, small plots. They actually have 16 that, that they, they believe because they, they've got uh, Claret Blanche and Claret Rose. They've got a, sort of a local small, I mean, they've, they've clonal material. It's a fascinating, fascinating thing. But what's great about this is that, uh, is, you know, it, when you taste a wine like this, oh, and, and uh, there's the, the 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 gentleman who eventually sort of came back to winemaking and and uh, and uh, along with his daughter Audrey, 
uh, makes this wine. Um, the the Vidal family um, they they are the inheritance uh, of this this land that's been in the family for like I said actually his on his mother's side of the family since the 1400s. Um, anyway, uh, what they do uh, this particular wine was done in uh, in like one of the others in concrete tanks. Um, this is actually another good thing. I, I, I love talking about these these things and these uh, sometimes eventually when you start to get way into uh, wine, sometimes you see these tech sheets. Um, this is a really good one because you see where it says farming practices. This winery is, uh, uh, these wines are organically farmed and they use also some biodynamic techniques, but they've never been certified. And so uh, um, rather than being, um, you know, uh, you know, misrepresenting and saying that they're something that they're not, you'll find it even if you shop at farmers markets, sometimes they'll say, well, unfortunately, all we can say is sustainable. Um, that umbrella, the word sustainable means, unfortunately, a lot of things to a lot of people. In a case like this, uh, they just they just have never used any chemicals, um, but it's very expensive to um, to get the certifications that one would need to have that on the label. So at a at a you know four or five hundred case uh, output, um, they're they're obviously not uh, not not really you know this this is not a a massive money making venture uh, here. So um, anyway, it's a it's a fun story. But the other thing that's great about this is that instead of, you know, my my own perception, I don't actually drink a lot of Chateau Neuf du Pops because uh, other ones, because they've got that sort of, I don't know, I, they've become what I call a bro wine. They're just, they're just all about, you know, big bombastic in your face sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, uh, extract and this wine's the opposite of all those things. This wine has uh, in it, it's almost a study in something that the the, the French from the region call Garrigue, uh, which is a um, is sort of a, um, a nebulous term that sort of de 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 describes the, the smell of the local uh, uh, herbs that grow amongst the, the the vines. This wine has a lot of that, so it's not it's not a mystery if you're if you if if, if you're smelling this and you smell these crazy dried herbs, that's that's something that's that's that that uh, that is almost disappeared in wines from this region, but there are some small producers that are still able to coax that out of their 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 region. John, and, I don't even uh, need to drink are. this wine. It is so aromatically pleasing. It's got this wonderful bright lift, um, a little stemmy, a little herbal, a little olive. Um, and really, this is like really old school wine. It, it ages beautifully. And it's a very dependable producer. They're also uh, right next to a very culty brand called Chateau Reyes. Right. Uh, real close. Uh, yeah. And, uh, really close, and and um, and and they they don't again they don't they don't go for much of the trends at this property. <laughs> so um, I love it. I, I and it's and and it's it's a really under the radar kind of brand, not just because its production is so small, but um, it, it's it's not really something that the uh, American press has glommed onto. It's it's really a sommelier kind of a wine uh, and uh, uh, kind of a wine nerd sort of a thing. Um, it gets really amazing press in in France and in in London, um, but uh, but but just not 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 much here and, it, and it's, it's it's not really something that's their focus it's funny audrey um when when this vintage first came out by the way they make a tiny tiny splash of white chateau of dupop as well um that's chateau of dupop uh there is white made in this region um but uh it's something like one nineteenth of the production um uh in 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 the region but um you know you you, you, you uh, uh audrey actually she was she she was telling my my uh, the the person who owns my my company uh, Hiram she was oh I'm sorry it's so it's so light this this year light looking and and he said no that's a badge of honor as far as I'm concerned um, it's it's this beautiful beautiful very pretty color uh, and something that 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 we don't get to see very often so anyway thank you very much Ian for having me and for 
for supporting this beautiful wine and uh, um, and uh, for giving it a, a, a chance to be tasted alongside such luminaries. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. And, and, uh, and John, I'm, you're, you're I'm always awesome. Uh, John's had a, a fantastic career in wine and you might have uh, seen John before and different Zooms we've done. So I really appreciate your uh, time and energy. But this wine, honestly, is one of my favorites, period. Um, I, 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 it's kind of a wine that I fight for a little bit too. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure, and I'd like to kind of ask everybody if you like it or not, because it is a different style. It is a that a more earth-oriented, mm -hmm. uh, leafy, uh, spicy, uh, stemmy, and uh, so good. I, isn't it pretty? Yeah, I think it's a great expression of an old world wine, right? Yes. Because we think new world, we think fruit forward, we think old world. This is a really great kind of example of true old world wine. And I may or may not be enjoying this with a veggie burger. So from that perspective, <laughs> it's really pairing wonderfully. Amazing. And I've been enjoying hearing this story from John as I'm kind of enjoying this with with my type of food pairing, which is on the, the veggie side of things. So it's Very good. It's Lovely. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure. So um, another thing you can look at when you're looking at Chateau Neuf to Pop is you can look at the alcohol percentage on a lot of bottles and you can pretty much tell, you know, which world they're living in. This says 14.5. It's a very warm place. And there are many Chateau Neuf to Pops that are far in excess of 16% alcohol. Um, and they get great scores and they're fun and they're delicious and they're different. Um, I, I, I like a lot of different wine personalities and, uh, we lost a, a really important Chateau Neuf de Pop, uh, producer yesterday, or at least I heard about him. Did you hear about that, John? No, what happened? I... Um, let me see if I can pull it up here. Um, <clears throat> I have to say, I've been running around all over town with <clears throat> people looking for last minute uh, uh, wines. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, this gentleman who traveled pretty extensively with the Rhone Valley producers, I'm going to have his name here in just a second. Sorry, I'm kind of spacing on that right now. Um, but uh, he uh, I cannot find it. Um, he is really involved in, in making, uh, oh, there he is, uh, Philippe Cambé. Oh, wow. He was, uh, he was actually a big part of the ripening movement and he, uh, all 500 pounds of him, he was a big, big man. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know how he was so active. I don't, he was 59 when he passed away, uh, very young, but, um, uh, he wasn't always a, uh, you know, he wasn't always 500 pounds. He was, he was a rugby player. You know, wow. Philippe was a rugby player uh, up until his late twenties and still did a little bit of that, but he was always a big guy. Um, and sometimes uh, his wines were bigger than he, but he is, <laughs> he's an absolute legend. I mean, um, you know, we're, we're going to miss him. We, yeah, we really I, I had, I had missed that he passed away. That it's, that's happened. a big one. Yeah. It just happened. Yeah. He's a, uh pretty important figure in in the Chateau Neuf de Pop and Rhone category and so we sent we raise a glass to Philippe Cambé tonight and cheers everybody and R.I.P. Philippe. John thank you so much I love talking thank you. to Chateau Neuf de Pop we could wax on this wine for a long time but we have yeah sorry I, I I went a little over oh over you're my, good buddy you're yeah. good you're good um and uh this is a wine that I, I think you'll always find on our store so if you if you liked the Chateau Neuf uh I carry a, a, a disordinate amount of inventory on this wine because I never want to run out. So uh, um, it just kind of falls in the right mode and the right day and the right time, the right place. Uh, you'll often see me sipping a bottle of this wine at the Hollywood Bowl. This is what I would take to uh, a concert out under the sky and, and uh, share with some friends and they all freak out like, what is this? This is so good. All right. Uh, and, and probably my vegetarian friends too, because I, I have a lot of those. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to move into Bordeaux, and I want to see if my friend Sebastian is doing okay. I'm here. How are you, buddy? I'm okay. Yeah, Sebastian is at home. He's been at home for a few days. His, uh, his uh, son or daughter? Daughter. 
your daughter came home with COVID. So Sebastian has to sequester for a while and he's getting through it. But uh, I, he's a trooper for being with us tonight. So thank you, Sebastian. Sebastian works for an importer and we, we've got royalty on this Zoom tonight. We have WineWise and Wilson Daniels and MMD um, and also Duclos. Duclos is the import importer of Great Bordeaux. And they've really uh, stuck a, a claim on this category with some very important figures in the Bordeaux market. Um, I just want to spend a second and kind of say, you know, 10 years ago, Bordeaux was so rogue in the way it was sold. And Duclos is really bringing some order to bringing the wine to market. Um, and it's uh, helping um and it's 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 fantastic because they take really good care of the wine and uh we, when we get it it's come straight from the chateau and it's kept at perfect temperature and they have very high ethos and the moex family is uh, involved and so are many others but uh you have a great job sebastian you get to represent some awesome wine and bordeaux is certainly you know the french wine i think that uh you know there could be an argument made that uh, Bordeaux is probably the most important wine in in France from a volume standpoint, from a dollar standpoint. Um, it's it's a really important uh, category. It's an investment, and uh, and there's certain wines that are made at the investment level, and then there's wines that are made for more casual drinking. Uh, tonight we're uh, drinking a wine from Margot Chateau Canac Brown. Can I, how, Sebastian, I pronounce that correct? Perfect. Okay. That's actually one of the easy ones to pronounce for. Yeah. Well, I, I have a hard time pronouncing anything. So that <laughs> one for the wind column tonight. All right. Here's our, here's our Margot. Now Margot is in Bordeaux and, uh, and sure. You know, when we travel to Bordeaux and, uh, We've taken some groups there. You got the capital city of Bordeaux, and Margot's just a little bit right here, a little bit further north from the town of Bordeaux. If you flew in in the airport, um, uh, and you could see Santa Steph and Pouillac and Saint Julian and Margot, um, and this this area is just really amazing. It's known as the Left Bank, and it uh, go back far enough, and it was swampland. Exactly. And then the Dutch, about like three, four hundred years ago, started to, uh, I mean, finished to, um, to dry up the whole region. And, um, and just being able to, to grow more vines, uh, because some were already, already there. And uh, Margo is the first appellation you go through when you go north from Bordeaux, the first major appellation uh, out of the four that you just uh, talked about. And there's, then there's the right bank over here, which we're not going to taste today, but in a future program, you know, Saint Emilion, Palmeral, and then the little towns in and around that make some really good values on the right bank. But in 1855, they classified the left bank because this area was owned by really wealthy landlords that had big plots of land. And all the people that worked at these places and stuff like that, they'd own a little plot over here, five acres or hectares. and those are just too small to categorize. So the classification of 1855 was really focused on this side of the fence. And uh, it's still a, a living, breathing document that's held up pretty well. Yeah, it has been modified just once because some uh, rich owner uh, really wanted to, to switch category, which was Mouton. Yeah, that's, that's Moutons. But otherwise, everything uh, kept the same. Pretty, pretty amazing. So, let's go. Let's go into the the winery. So, as you can see, it's not really a building that is typically French. Um, that building uh, was built at the end of the um, 18th century by a Scottish man, John Lewis Brown. And so that's why the chateau is coming, uh, is, is called after his name, Brown. Contenac is um, the, the village uh, that is in the area. And when I talk about a village, it's like just a few buildings. 
Um, two very famous chateaus are on the plateau of Contenac. Contenac Brown, which is this one, and Bran Contenac, which is just uh, a little bit more south. Uh, but both of the estates are very, very similar. Um, Contenac Brown was um, owned by a, a long time, uh, for the last 30 years, uh, by a insur French insurance company, AXA. And there was uh, the, the, the chateau needed a, a, a little bit of a renewal and investment. And so AXA started 30 years ago to really remodel a few things, try to replant some vines, try to be more precise in the way that we're making wine. And then two, uh, two years ago now, at the end of 2019, uh, a new ownership came and the, the rest on, of the investment that needed to happen, happened even faster. So during when the pandemic started, they actually accelerated um, the renewal of a lot of technical tools of um, the new center which is going to be uh, built in earth, uh, the actual earth of the, the ground around the chateau. Uh, and that's, that's, the first, uh, that's the first one in Bordeaux. No one has that. Um, so they're changing a lot of things. So over the years, over the like last 20, 30 years, you can see that this uh, chateau, Contenac Brown, has improved a lot and the quality of the wines have slowly but surely improved as well. They're much more precise and, um, and much more refined, especially in the last five years. Um, they, they follow a trend as well of, uh, in general in Bordeaux, of trying to get rid of the style of uh, Robert Parker that was really changing uh, the way uh, that Bordeaux was producing and making uh their own wines um so now since like probably you can feel it in 15 um the wines are produced with a more traditional border style which is power but with a lot of freshness so um global warming helped bordeaux a lot uh in terms of having cabernet sauvignon more ripe so everyone benefits from that in bordeaux um, and so this is something that really allows to have wines that are like have more freshness, but also more precise and um, that are more, that are exactly ripe as they want, as the producer want them to be. And this is a very, very important thing in the evolution of Bordeaux. You will see that over the years, the, war the warmer it gets, the more precise and the more freshness uh, people will manage to, to get the, the, the wines. Beautiful. So, um, coming to the Chateau or this wine, um, it's a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. Here you can see on the left, José, José, um, who is the general manager of the estate. He uh, started with AXA, with the former owners, and uh, the new owners kept exactly the same management just gave more uh, more tools and more um, money to make sure that the strategy would would, uh, would go further and they will reach um, their final goal. On the right is Tristan, uh, the actual owner and uh, who is uh, managing uh, with, with Jose as well. Um, I think what's interesting is uh, mostly the next slide where well, okay, let's talk about this one. Um, so the chateau has a very, very special style. Um, it was a place where people were actually living and are still living. Uh, some are still living in, in the buildings. Um, the, the vineyard um, area is huge, but only 68 hectares are uh, planted with vines. And the rest, um, as you can see on the left, it's a huge botanical uh, garden uh, of 110 hectares uh, with like a lot of, uh, of trees that actually were planted by the uh, original owner, uh, Mr. Brown. So you have a lot of sequoias that are 200 years old and, um, and species that are not from France at all. 
Um, so it, it seems like it's a bit young uh, regarding California sequoias. Uh, 200 years old is, is, is nothing for you, but for France, it was not something that was um, that was uh, very, very big. That's something that you can see at Ducru Bocayou as well. I don't know like how those two owners were crazy about trees, uh, <laughs> but they have huge, huge uh, uh, gardens. Um, so Contact Brown also started um, a trend to be cleaner in the way they make wine. So in Bordeaux, there's not really, it's difficult to say you're biodynamic, you're organic, you're sustainable. Um, I think for the last 15 years, a lot of producers really started to pay attention. The issue in Bordeaux is that it's most of the uh, one of the most humid region in France. And because of that, uh, everyone wants to be ideally uh, biodynamic, but it is it takes a long time to get the knowledge and to experiment to make sure that once you turn 100 percent biodynamic, you don't um, you don't jeopardize uh, some whole production uh, in, in vintages that are going to be very humid. So it's little by little. Uh, I can tell you I was in Contact Brown um, right before the pandemic started. So that was my last trip in Bordeaux. And um, I, I've seen um, beautiful things. Uh, they're reintroducing a lot of uh, animals on the vineyard. Uh, they produce their own um, honey. They, things are happening. So it's going to take like probably five to eight years uh, for a lot of chateaus to turn biodynamic, but I'm not even sure they are uh, going to advertise that. Uh, but but it's it's a good trend and I think it's going to benefit for uh, everyone. Beautiful. Thank you. On the next slide, what I want to show. Sure. The following one. Following one. One more. Yeah. This is the the so map. yeah, this is the map of the chateau. And so you can see that the um, that's the original um, land and you can see all the parcels on the on the right on the left and and the, the park that is actually huge and didn't change at all with a little stream of water uh, going through the um, the vineyard and now they also have a little bit of uh, of vines in front of the chateau so on north uh, as, as you as you can face it this was the original one and and uh, and that's what I want to see on the next slide. Not yet. Not yet. That should be the last one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, the plateau of Contnac is very famous uh, in Margot. This is probably one of the best. Sorry. So, all good. One of the best uh, terroirs in in Margot. Um, so the plateau is actually a little slope going toward the river. Um, so the, the picture is taken from the chateau. Uh, you can see that the first plots are, are from the chateau and then moving um, to the river, it's gonna be some uh, plots from Chateau Palmer, Chateau Margot. Um, so it's really in the middle of the best, best terroirs um, of, um, of Margot. The soil is the key here. Uh, it's pretty deep gravels with subsoil of clay and limestone. So it's great for um, Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. The key is um, it's deep enough gravels to have the Cabernet Sauvignon really enjoy the heat. And the gravels, as John uh, explained before, uh, retain the heat and, and give it back uh, usually whenever it's cold or during the night. On this plateau, you have a very big temperature difference between night and day, and and this is great for uh, for Cabernet Sauvignon. On the other side, Merlot needs a lot of water all the time, so um, it the, the Merlot roots are going to go really deep to get to the uh, limestone and mostly the clay to get a permanent supply of water uh, during summer when it's uh, when it's really hot. And so this plateau is really good for both of those uh, grapes. Um, to talk about the vintage 16 is, is probably one of the most amazing vintages in, in, in the history of Bordeaux. Um, it was a claim um, at, at the time and with the years we can see that it's, it was a hot vintage. There was no heat wave. So 
Um, the wine are ripe, but they're not cooked or overripe, but it's the freshness. Uh, the freshness of 16 is something a little bit unique that we have not seen before with the alliance of ripeness, heat, and the, and the freshness. So you get delicate wines that are actually really easy to drink, uh, pretty young, uh, and it's, it's just a delightful wine with a balance with deep, dark fruits and this, this freshness that comes with like a little bit of aeration. The wine is, is, is just a, a no-brainer and you can drink it uh, right away with actually a lot of things. Um, meat is always the, the, the obvious uh, choice. A good ribeye uh, in Bordeaux, when you actually go there, they always take their barbecue out and, and just cook a ribeye, and that's what they throw in your plate with different different um, vintages of the wine. But that's 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 the perfect um, for sure perfect pairing. Yeah, I had the pleasure of uh, going to Chateau Margaux once, and I asked Mr. Pontier uh, why is Chateau Margaux so great and it was a perfect question at the perfect time because it was pouring rain and he looked out the window and he goes look the vineyard there's no puddle the rain is just falling and it's it wasn't accumulating anywhere the soil is draining and that's why Chateau Margaux is such a, an amazing terroir and uh, that's this is uh, really a cool picture to kind of show you uh, the, the immensity of it these are big properties and they they tend to make a good amount of wine, but they only like make one or two. They tend to make like a first wine, maybe a second, maybe a third, depending on how huge the, the brand is. But uh, uh, it's all about, it's not about making more wine, it's about elevating quality. So they'll just take their best wine and put it in their first bottling and then uh, take maybe the younger vines or stuff that didn't go into their best wine and make it into a second. And that's kind of the model that they use. That's that's exactly that, and they they uh, they really reduce the percentage of production of their first wine. So now forty, I think on 16, 49 percent of the harvest is going to the first label, and the rest is going into the second label. And the the wine, the grapes that are not selected to go in the wine are are just sold uh, uh, in bulk. Cool. And they also produce a white wine, very small production, but it's called Alto. And as, as actually a lot of uh, Margot, like Chateau Margot is producing Pavillon Blanc and, uh, and Brand Contact as well has started a, a wine for the last two years, a white wine. Barnett, how you doing, man? Did you enjoy? Uh, yes, these are, it's a wonderful lineup, you know, of some pretty terrific wines from some great years. Um, this one, the nose is really wonderful. It's just delightful. And uh, I, I, I would hope, I think, that a little bit more time, the fruit will come out a little bit more in the, uh, in the palate. But it, it's, there's a lot of wonderful stuff in, in this uh, Cantonac uh, brown. It's yeah. pretty great. Yeah, these wines have different evolutions and different moments when they're young. You kind of primary, you kind of see the fruit, you feel the, the wood, you feel the earth. They're not necessarily perfectly married together right now, uh, but the, the, there's so much good, neat material there, so much good color and concentration, yeah. and, and, the, and the fabric is so good. That's what uh, wine experts like to watch and, and see, you know, uh, this is a wine that I want to own and invest mm. in. And there's like a 10 year, number that's just really magical when these wines turn 10 years old they just mm. it's yeah, like yeah. Uh, children becoming adults they just kind of hit that number and they boom uh really change direction yeah. don don ketterling is on the zoom with us and his daughter ha has worked with me for over uh three years and i uh, thank you don for being here and enjoying and alex has been a, she does all of our powerpoints and communications and talks to all the wineries for us so thank you don She uh, she said she was out uh, being a you're a, that you're a slave driver and you're out pushing her to, to deliver some wine tonight so she's she couldn't be on. Yes, yeah, she's absolutely correct. 
uh, <laughs> Christmas. And uh, we we had over a lot of deliveries to make today. So uh, uh, while I'm sitting here sipping great wine and enjoying this show, uh, that my wife and her are out making deliveries. Some of you uh, got a little later delivery because we were just stretched so hard to get to get these things out. But we we do a lot of courier, like direct, you know, no no overnight shipping and uh, just straight to your door type of shipping. And it's 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 a really good part of our business, but it, it can be a challenge and. Are you having rain down there? Not yet, but it will be coming. It's very close. We're getting we're getting snow here in Reno tonight. So cool. And you got the tasting kit delivered to Reno, right? Yes. I'm glad that worked out. It arrived on time. It was about uh, 1 p.m. It came, so it was good. Bravo. And Jeff Costa, bravo. Hey guys, good to see you both. Thank you for joining us. How are you? Awesome. Indeed. Can't can't wait for the uh, can't wait for the star turns. Got the uh, oh, look at the view. You brought the, the creme brulee. We got the creme <laughs> Wow, that is. Uh, we we might have to come back to you and ask you to blow that torch. Uh, oh come us. on! I, I can't wait. I'm I'm waiting. Yeah, let's 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 hit it. Let's hit it. We're gonna go there. Uh, and uh, let me just finish by saying hi to a couple more folks. Um, Milwaukee, thank you for. Your patience, you got your delivery pretty late, but it made it. And Satsuko is in Japan listening, and thank you for always being here. Melvin J, uh, it's, it's your holiday. Uh, CPA, hardworking guy, this is your time yeah. to relax, huh? <laughs> but it, it's good. We haven't been able to do the last couple lives, so this, this has been very enjoyable tonight. Excellent. The, the, the recordings are good, but it's much more fun to be here live. I understand. Mr. Berlinger, it's great to see you too. Thank you for joining us. There's some of you, Mike Dillenbach. Thank you guys. Is this your first time being with us? No, no, this is our third or fourth time. Oh, nice. Yeah, and uh, my daughter is from Chicago and you delivered wine to her at one of the previous ones in Chicago. Oh, I remember this, I remember this, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah it was great. So anyway, uh, She's here. She just arrived today, so she can enjoy it with us. So these are these have been wonderful wines today. Fantastic. Well, I'm glad you could be enjoy here. Them. And yeah, I think it's just our fourth time. Awesome. Well, thank you. I'm sorry I didn't recognize that. I think your name's showing up a little different on the screen. Then I have a more visual memory than names, but uh, it says Mike Dillon back all in one word. So yeah, yeah. Marilyn Madsen. Ian. I'm so happy to see you. How's uh, Hollywood? You guys got you avoided the strike. We avoided the strike, but I've been working 83 hours a week making superheroes. I mean, so come on! There's a huge appetite for superheroes. I know there is, but I am only human. But I have two weeks off, so. <laughs> nice. What's your biggest project? Are you allowed to say? I am working on Guardians of the Galaxy 3. I am in charge of the Star-Lord, Drax and Nebula, and Sylvester Stallone as the car. Wow. How awesome. That's great. Super fun, super fun. Well, um, I love I love chatting with the group, but we've got uh, one more wine to get to. Mm -hmm. And Sebastian, uh, thank you. This is also yours coming from Duclos. Uh, we go to, uh, you know, I, I, first of all, I got to get up on my, my soapbox for a second. I have so much passion for dessert wine. And I think that dessert wines are so often looked past. And um, I did an event for a really famous guy a couple weeks ago. And I tried everything in my power to put dessert wine in his mouth. And he wouldn't even try it. And this is, this is like one of the most pleasurable things you can drink. These wines are, you know, whether they're Hungarian Tokai or wines from the Loire or wines from Alsace or this Sauterne. Um, and there's so many other classic dessert wines. I just, the, the category is so amazingly diverse. Um, but they are kind of um, niching and getting smaller. And because and, Americans in general, we don't drink much dessert wine. And uh, I will challenge you uh, between now and, and New Year's, uh, try to open a bottle of, of dessert wine with some family and try not to enjoy the evening a little bit more because dessert wine really takes 
an event to the next level. Um, it slows everything down, uh, really can take the rough gruffness off of your uh, father-in-law or mother-in-law and really soften them up. So uh, think about dessert wine. There's so many good ones and this is one of them. Sebastian uh, turned me on to this wine and we have been selling a lot of this wine, Sebastian. Um, it's a great price. And let me explain too. This is uh, the second wine. Remember we we're talking about first wine, second wine. This is the second wine of Rio Sec. Uh, and it is uh, uh, a, a great price point because of that. Um, you know, maybe great dessert wine can get a little pricey when it's got a famous producer behind it, but this one hits the right price. And so Sebastian, with that, I'll go into the PowerPoint and let you teach us a little bit more about this baby. Sure. So Yosek is actually one of the big guys in, in Sauterne. Um, the winery is pretty famous. Um, alongside with uh, Chateau d'Iquem, Chateau de Fargue, um, Rio Sec, with like uh, a state like Sud Viro, or, or really um, like solid uh, wineries that can produce very good wines, much every vintage, even if it's um, very, very difficult uh, because you need a lot of very specific uh, climatic conditions to actually produce this wine. Um, in general, sweet wine, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, so Rio Sec um, uh, is uh, <coughs> coming from uh, the monks originally. Um, Carme means, um, Carme is, is coming from the, um, the travels, I don't know if I say it well, but like the Carmelite, uh, which was one of the ways uh, not ways, but like uh, streams of Catholic uh, uh, monks. Monks, yeah, exactly. So Carm is the, the short cut of Carmelite. Um, so basically, um, we, we can um, start to trace about 200, uh, a little bit like 250 years ago that the, the monks were producing wine over there. And then uh, after the, uh, with the French Revolution, the winery was confiscated, uh, confiscated Confiscate, yeah. um, uh, from the monks, from the church, and um, was part of the, the state uh, of France for um, a, a while and then was auctioned uh, like to whoever wanted to buy it um, like 10 or 15 years after the revolution. So it led to a lot of different owners over the years. And, uh, and then in, uh, at the beginning of the 80s, uh, Lafitte Rothschild uh, purchased uh, the winery. So same, it gave a lot of money and knowledge uh, to this winery that was a little bit uh, undermanaged and um, all the the charm and the quality of Yosek um, came back uh, little by little with a new cellar, new um, wine aging uh, buildings, and everything was renewed, but the spirit stayed, stayed the same. Um, so you, you, it, it's it's like a lot of wineries in Bordeaux. At one point, you need a new owner investor that's just gonna take a lot of the wines. Uh, from under management to something more precise, something better. And that's that's the Rothschild family that did that for, uh, for Yosek. Um, so very quickly, Sauterne uh, is exactly where you, you did the red circle. So it's 30, 30 miles south of Bordeaux. It takes an hour to drive from Bordeaux to Sauterne. So it's not something um, that, that you can do like this. Uh, just so you know, from saint Estef, which is the north of the Medoc, to Sauterne, it takes about like two hours, two hours and a half, depending if there's traffic in Bordeaux or not. But it's uh, there's no highway, there's no big roads, it's only small roads. And it's uh, this piece of land is, is uh, 
it's difficult to explore when you just have one or two days. So anytime you go to Bordeaux, just focus on one region and then focus on another one when you come back. But don't try to go everywhere. You're just, it's going to be very difficult. Bordeaux uh, is the largest production uh, in all of France, right? Um, I, in, in bottles, probably not. No, is the Cote d'Iron bigger? I, I think Languedoc is still bigger. Oh yeah? Um, but it's not the same kind of wines. In Languedoc, it's a lot of volume. Very, very bulk yeah. entry level supermarket wines. Uh, there are some great wineries as well, but the, the, the production is, uh, is just kind of, but you have between six and 7,000 producers in Bordeaux. So it is very dense. Uh, a lot of estates are tiny, uh, but in terms of export, we think with Burgundy right now, these are the two, uh, the two biggest region in terms of value. Dollars, yeah. And as far as comparing it to like Napa Valley, it's about eight times larger than the Napa Valley. That's the number. Uh, yeah, it's way bigger than Napa. Yeah. Um, so, as you can see, um, Rio Sec, it is same on a plateau that's a little slope. Um, the, let me just remind you how, um, how Sauternes and, and sweet wines are made, uh, at least those ones. So they use a mushroom called um, Botrytis cinarea, which basically comes from a little stream of water they call it a river, but I, I wouldn't say so because this is very, very little. Uh, the Ciron, which basically gives to that area a lot of um, uh, fog in the morning and like gives the perfect conditions for that very precise mushroom to go into the grapes and uh, infect the grape. And um, we call that noble rot. So there are a lot of magazines or websites or people using novel rot in the wine world. And this is, this is named after uh, this, um, this mushroom that goes into the, uh, the grapes. So basically the grapes um, are gonna get mold inside and are gonna look like, um, like golden raisins. Um, and so whenever you're going to go in the vineyard and harvest, um, the, the people harvesting are experts. I mean, experts have a lot of experience because um, the producers keep the same people um, doing that generations after generations. Um, it is very different from harvesting white or red wine. You go into the vines, you have to look at each grape and select each grape anytime you 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 pass into into the rows so if you think they're ready you take them if you don't you have to leave them and you do many passes many different times in the vineyard and you have to um, basically catch um, the grapes at the perfect maturity so the selection is crazy and <coughs> it is um, the production of, of Sauternes is seven times less than a regular uh, than regular red wine. Wow! So when you get seven bottles of uh, red wine out of one uh, vine, you get one uh, of um, of dry wine, of dry uh, sweet wine. Right. Dry. Sorry, sweet wine. Sweet wine. Yeah, it's sure. Um, so that's that's, that's how it's made, and it, it's it's uh, it's a challenge. And that's why sometimes you can think that dry, that sweet wines are expensive, but it, 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 it asks for a lot of job, of work. And it's a sticky job. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Yeah. And the climatic conditions, you don't have them every year. So, uh, for example, uh, 18, 19 and 20 are terrible for Sauterne. Uh, you had frost, you had hell. Uh, and the production was very, very, very small for the, the three last vintages. But 2021 is going to be good. Wow. And uh, <clears throat> there's also a little contrarian thing with Sautern. Sometimes in the more difficult red wine vintages, Sautern is really, really good because 
the conditions are perfect for that. Exactly, because the conditions are not as good for uh, red in Bordeaux on the difficult years for red, by the white and the sweet whites. They're always, I mean, it's not always 100% true, but 90% of the time, that's, that's great. Uh, 13, uh, like 17, uh, 11, they're going to be just amazing vintages for, uh, for white wine. And, and, and in the last 20 years, go for the, um, the odd numbers. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Well, like one, three, five, seven, nine, with the exception of 10, 11, 13, 15, 17, 19, were just amazing vintages for, uh, uh white and sweet wines. And when I say white, it's just because there's a little bit more tension. So the wines are a little bit less round but a little bit more mineral and have more tension. I'm not comparing anything to uh, Burgundy or anything else, but just with our Bordeaux, there's a little bit more tension. Cool. Thanks for all that, Sebastian. And we're looking at Semillon as the major grape variety. Yes. Semillon, and on that vintage, it's, uh, it's a major one. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc is pretty small, even if usually we have a little bit more, like around 5% on, on other vintages. And there's always a touch of Muscadel, which, which is going to give this very special um, uh, flavor uh, to a, f a few Sauternes. Not all of them have Muscadel, but it gives a, a really nice fruit, like a little citrus kick uh, and, uh, when it's young, and it, it turns into like tropical fruits, apricots, uh, when you get a, a little bit more age. Um, what is very specific about this uh, second wine at Riosec um, is that the, the first wine is going to be um, has a, a, a concentration of sugar that's going to be really high. So that's going to be a super, super sweet wine. Uh, the second label is going to be made with a different purpose. Um, they want to have more acidity and less uh, sugar concentration. So it is way more easier to drink with a lot of different things. It's more easy to pair. It's less heavy. Uh, so it's not like a wine that you can have with only with the dessert or even after dessert, like a digestif or, or something like this. You can pair it with um, a, a, a lot of different things. And um, especially what I love with that is roasted chicken. So I know it's not a, a, a usual pairing in the US, uh, but um, anything that is going to be roasted, so the crispy skin of the chicken is, is just going to develop some sweetness. And so that sweetness is going to go along very well with the, with the sauterne, what are not too sweet. So the, the calm is going to be perfect for that, but it's going to pair also very well with obviously uh, foie gras that is the pairing, but uh, desserts, um, Roquefort, all the blue. I love it with Roquefort. I was just going to say that. It's yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, even, even goat cheese. It's great. Uh, a lot of cheeses are actually much better with white wine than, than red wine. Absolutely. Um, so it's, it's at this price level, you can really explore and, and have fun and enjoy. Yeah. We're talking about uh, $30 a half bottle and, uh, that's just a really good value. Um, can pay what's a, what's a, you know, 2016 real sec full, like, uh, like first bottling go for is that over $150 uh I think it should be between yeah 100 and 150 50, no for a full bottle yeah more 150 something like this so I like I like uh Sautern in the half bottle it does actually age really slowly once you open it in the grocery and you can put it in your refrigerator um you could probably drink it for you know 10 days and have very slow decline Bravo, uh, Jeff Costa Bravo. Did you fire that thing up already? Did we miss it? You missed it. Yes. Yeah. It was. So it was interesting. It, it wasn't. I, I mean, I noticed. I was commenting to Paula. It. Um, it didn't. Didn't pair as a normal, quote unquote, normal saw turns that I'm used to a much sweeter uh, style. Right. It was a little different. It was a different pairing. Yeah. It's not. It's not quite as sweet as some of the. Right. And, yeah. Right. And those uh, really sweet ones, they do need some uh, extra time. And yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Ian, Ian, a week ago we opened a 2001 Riosac, and I got to tell you, I did that was the hit of the party. 
It always is. That's the thing, man. You could buy, you know, I have friends that show up with these baller wines and they're very expensive, you know, and they're very proud to pull that out. You show up with a $20, $30 bottle of Sautern, you can really like, whoa, that's so good. So it's just uh, a really... Yeah, of course, 20 years ago, I didn't pay that much for it, but that's another discussion. Yeah, that's <laughs> just, just so you know, 2001 is, is the vintage in Sautern. I know, I know. It, it is. I believe it is one of the was, top ones for the last fifty years. I believe it was uh, Spectator Wine of the Year, if I, if I recollect. Uh, yeah. So no, it was just starting to look a, a, a bit dark, but it it drank fabulous. Yeah, they get, they can get almost brown. I had some really yeah. old Sauternes that are just chocolate brown, and they're still beautiful. They get so exotic yes. and the nose just continues to change and that's when you go with that creme brulee there jeff mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but the uh um uh, this this little charms is really uh, charming and uh priced well and and getting nice uh comments from the people that have bought it i hope you guys enjoy it and enjoy the category uh sebastian you've been a wealth of information i thank you so much Thank you. Uh, there's a couple more pictures. If there's anything else you wanted to touch on, I'll just go out here. This is a uh, this is the entire estate. Yeah, from the from the you you see it from the the Ciro. So that's that's the the lowest part of the slope, and it's very close to the river. Beautiful. Well, any questions? Um, we have. Uh, I'm not sure if all the experts are still on with us, but we can we can manage a few tough questions. Bao Chio, thank you for being here. Um, I know that uh, William is getting ready to take a trip to see his family. I want to thank him for being with us uh, from Wilson Daniels and John Baccio from WineWise and Sebastian from Duclo. Um, there's some chat activity. Does anybody have a question? Well, make sure you t uh, take a look in your email. We sent out an uh, email, a thank you email that has that discount code. It's there waiting for you. It'll work until probably Friday morning. Um, uh, so if you um, you know want to think about things, you get 10% off on anything. We will deliver it probably next Tuesday at this point. And if you need something right away, we still are delivering for the holiday, we have uh, delivery still for Friday, um, and uh, we can get it there. We have uh, Friday's actually kind of light. You know, this is the, the, the holiday shopping is kind of over, but if you need something, uh, come to us. We can get get it there fast, and you don't have to go to the store and and have all that problems. Um, plus, we uh, you know safe a little safer. Um, you know, we got started doing this delivery stuff, and then when the pandemic struck up and and we don't know what's going to happen next, but uh, our drivers, uh, um, they you know take good care to make sure that the wine gets to you without uh, uh, any interference. And uh, if you have any problems with the drivers, you let us know too, because they're supposed to be taking really good care of uh, their hygiene and uh, the way the wines are, are taken care of. It's a perfect time to ship wine too. It's nice and cool. Uh, so... Uh, Grab a few bottles, and uh, if you live outside of LA, it's only ten bucks to uh, have a ship it. We have uh, stars of California wine coming in January. Uh, we have solidified that wine list, and I believe that event is now visible on our website. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna go there real quick and take a look at it for the first time because my designer was working on it today. I was. As, as you heard, I'm I'm put whipping the whipping the team shape. We have we have to turn some corners, um, but you know we we uh, we had some events, some live events that we had started to plan for January and February. The most expensive event you've ever built is the one that you had to cancel. Um, so you know we're going to really return back to uh, Zoom for a while. Um, and here's our SARS of California wine. You can click in and see the wine lineup and pricing. That, uh, oh, that's actually uh, sold on our other website, the, the Wine Cloud. This is where our classes are taught. And that's 
for charity reasons and other things. We've got some really cool wines. I'm going to show my family's beekeeper. We've got some really interesting wines from different parts of California, different grape varieties, and some really good personalities um, on that Zoom. It's going to be a lot of fun. And then in uh, uh, February, we're going to really focus on the Rhone Valley. So we're going to do Chateau Neuf de Pop. We're going to do Hermitage. We're going to hit uh, up in the Cornas and uh, Vaccara, and we're really working with some classic brands. So if you like Rhone, um, uh, you might want to tune in for the stars of the Rhone. Uh, those wines are still being organized right now, but we'll have it up in the next 10 days or so. And, uh, and we'll continue out with uh, some of our events. Our annual calendar just kind of goes into a repeat mode. But we do have some great classes along the way, like I have my dessert wine class coming up. And uh, just take a look at some of the stuff we've really been working to tool because we had to cancel a couple of uh, critical events that we were putting some pretty big deposits on space and starting to get some wine wines organized for. And so uh, this is our pivot again. We just keep keep rolling to the next opportunity. Well, it's holiday time, and I want to thank you guys for all of your time tonight. I hope everybody enjoyed. Baucio, William Davis, uh, Sebastian, Noreen, uh, thank you guys for your expertise. And I uh, hope everyone has a safe and beautiful holiday, and uh, we'll see you in, uh, in the near future, I hope. Happy thank holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Holidays, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Yeah.